This is Academy of Tone today with special uh, guest and friend Frank Nimsgern. And um, yeah, we are kind of local celebrities. <laughs> Besides another gentleman whose name is Alex Bayroth. Oh. Um, you know, we are kind of um, from the same area here. Yeah. And um, Frank is somebody who is famous for being like a musical composer, but he's more than this. He's a, well, a guitar player, killer guitar player. He plays the piano like killer. And um, yeah, you are famous for your musicals. Mm -hmm. And um, you have a big heritage in the family when it comes to music. Your father, Sigmund Nimskern, mm -hmm. is um, um, a Wagner baritone. Like um, not only Wagner, but he he got famous because of you know his his Wagner interpretations, and he won the Grammy Award with Placido Domingo for the Lone Green, which was a very famous reference recording for all the singers who came after right. that. So, um, but the thing is, when you are a German singer, you always you know the the top notch is when you sing Wagner. But he sang everything, like from Verdi to Bach, he sang. Everything, but it's, it's a typical thing. Like when you are as a German singer, you are when you sing Wagner in the main roles, you are a Wagner singer. You know, it's, okay. It's yeah. The same with us. You know, when you when you are a rock guitar player, you can't play jazz. You know. Yeah. It's, 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 okay, there's of course a cliche and the category um, yeah. that that is like you you are in this kind of this is the guy that does yeah. this thing. But uh, at least we all need to have a simplified version. But I mean, the, your dad is kind of a trademark in that business oh yeah um, and my question to you is mm. how does it feel having such an um, how you say like an strong energy in the house being your dad 
and growing up in this kind of environment? Well, actually, first of all, I'm very grateful that I was, uh, when we were, when my brother and I, when we were kids, that we were like traveling all over the, the world with my father and we could um, see all the operas and the rehearsals and meet all the big conductors and, and, and the singers. But in the end, it's like um, you train your ear and you get very experienced with classical music. But there was a time I was, um, I, I, there, there was, it was an incident uh, and it was happened, it was going on in, in Berlin at that time. My father was recording with uh, Herbert von Karajan, a very famous conductor. conductor, Herbert von Karajan. I mean, even I know Harald von uh, yeah, I think everyone knows Karajan. Yeah. And, uh, they had this uh, Parsifal recording, and uh, they were in the studio in the in the, in the recording room, uh, just checking what they just did right now, what they did in the Philharmonics. And uh, I was, I think, like six years old, and Karian was sitting in front of me, near the monitor boxes like here, and my father was in the background. And there is this picture in the in the in the booklet of the Parsifal, and you see a little boy <laughs> sitting like you. this. Yeah, it was yeah. me with six years. And I was totally like intimidated because before that picture was taken, Karian was just throwing his score towards me on my lap. And he said, Nimskan Junior, tell me where are we? You know, with the Read process. this. Read this. Read this, read this know, book. So. Like, like, where are we? Exactly. Oh, yeah. and, and that was for me like, oh no, I, I don't want to be there. There was, yeah. so, there was so much pressure. and. Uh, I got shocked, by the way. Even though I, I really love the recording, and I love all the classical music. I'm still, you know, mm -hmm. listening a lot of classical stuff. But it was like for me, I have to step into another uh, territory of music. Yeah. And then came the second thing um, that um, we were. My, my family was living in New York at the time, and uh, my father was singing at the Metropolitan Opera, and I was going to the rehearsal like Tosca, like Fidelio, and I couldn't see any Tosca and any Fidelio anymore. So I went to Tower Records, which was at that time really rewarded. The record shop, well, you know, they had everything. The, you know. the music store. I remember the times when you yeah. went to a music uh, shop to listen to vinyl. Yeah. Vinyl, you it's, know? Exactly, yeah. And, and you, you went to a, like a booth yeah. uh, here in Saarbrücken, they had Phonak or. No, Fo and, and Sarafon. Sarafon. Exactly, Sarafo, okay. yeah. yeah. And, and, and there was like a, a, a little booth you put on the headset, or they had a stereo system, yeah. and they put the vinyl on, and you had like half an hour with a record and then you, you, you listen to serious music. Exactly, yeah. And that wasn't, Tower Records was the same thing, so you could go there and check out some music. So, but the thing is, since I'm only, were listening to classical music and only new classical music, you know, I went to New York to Tower Records and I went, you know, uh, normally it was like, you always go to the upper floor, which was the serious music, like classical music. I was checking out like Conte of Man, all the operas. And this time I was just like, you know, sneaking in and looking at somebody seeing me, you know, like, you know, someone watching me. And I went to the, to the uh, uh, to the f floor where it says popular music and rock music, and I was checking out other music. And at that time, I said, oh, "How can I tell my parents that I I want to you know step into the, the in another style, you know, step into another you know another house and of of, of music?" So I, I I was listening to. Then I saw, "Oh, there is a thing. It's called rock opera. <laughs> <laughs> so it must be opera too." And I was checking, and I was buying the Tommy, the Who, and I was buying Carola Quattrofenia. And I was totally, it was like a like a drug to me because yeah. that was a totally new thing because the energy and everything and I could identify with the lyrics of Pete Townsend and at that time The Who was f for me the next Richard Wagner. Absolutely. Know? I am a, a huge fan of the Quattrofenia. Yeah, Quattrofenia, totally Can you see the real me? Can exactly. you? Bah, 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 bah. Exactly. Such a great energy and yeah. still this epic thing. Yeah. And you know, love, rain on me. Love, rain on me, yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, I love this, um, <clears throat> listening to this kind of, um, not just a, a three minute pop song. I mean, the Who did, you know, three minute pop songs mm. and smashed the guitars. But on the other hand, they did serious, big, I, I, how to describe it, like uh, real pieces of music, yeah. just like classical music. Exactly, and that was the thing. Yeah. So I was not so far away from Wagner and Puccini with the Who. Yeah. I am, it's not allowed to say that in the classical scene, I think you're getting, you know, like crucified if you're saying that. But the thing is that, uh, you know, what I loved about, you know, Wagner, uh, the Richard Wagner stuff, I found it in Quattrofenia and the Who. 
I found the same energy, you know, yeah. but with, with other instruments and with Roger Daudry screaming his balls off, you yeah. know, but this was my, this was my tenor then, you know, so there were some similarities and, 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 and uh, until now, you know, and since today, what I'm, what I'm doing right now is actually a combination out of the classical world, the rock world and the jazz. So I'm, I took everything a little bit together, you know, yeah. so, but to make a long story short. So when I came back from, from New York, I went like also secretly on the flea market and uh, because I was a classical trained piano player and I bought really a, a black Stratocaster, like a like a Clapton, and I, I was teaching myself because I came from the piano, and I was saying, "Oh, this is C, C major." I was <laughs> teaching myself the the, the 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 voicings I learned on the piano. Yeah, so I found my own system. And when I came back to Germany, my parents they said, "Okay, if he 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 picked now the guitar, if that's the thing. He needs real teachers." But that's another story. Then then you, you come into play, I think. Okay, <laughs> real teachers. I I had a teacher. I had I tried to to learn some jazz. Yeah. Um, I was basically self-taught, you know, just like you. And then at a certain point, you you look around and hey, who 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 can you learn some stuff from? Mm. So and there's a guy called Heiner Franz here in Saarbrücken, mm. and he's a, I think he's a great jazz player. I'm I'm not the guy to judge his playing, mm. but I think uh, oh, yeah. he knows what he's doing. And and um, I had I think three or five lessons with him, and then we had a big fight. Mm, of course. Uh, because he was a kind of fundamentalist mm. um, and this was for me the end of my jazz career because he was so um, radical radical in a yeah. way mm. that I, I said, you know what, fa Heiner, keep your money, fuck you, mm. fuck jazz. Mm. Bam, That's mm. the, that, that, that was my end of it. Mm. And I mean, on one hand, I'm happy about it. On the other hand, I'm sad about it. I'm happy about it because I had to do my own thing <laughs> mm. um, and I'm sad about it because there's a couple of things that I actually would have loved to learn from yeah. him. Yeah. I'm sure that he knows that stuff but there was no chance because uh, <laughs> two, two worlds that didn't want, he, he didn't want to accept my world in a way, well, and adapt and take me from where I was yes. to where I wanted to go. I think that, I mean, I spent, I think, two, three years with him studying and I, and I learned a lot and I'm, I'm real, um, very appreciative and very grateful for the time with Heiner Franz. Uh, but the thing is, the attitude, what, what the jazz, they ha you also find it in the classical scene and in the jazz scene, especially in the old bebop scene, you find that attitude, we are the holy grail of music and this is the holy grail, yeah. you see? And for me, it's, there is just good music and bad music, you know, and I, I think there are some Beatles songs that are, that are just like timeless classics forever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there is, and, and I also know some, uh, you know, forgive me, there is some Mozart stuff I don't like. I think it's boring, you know, and I think some Mozart stuff is incredible, you know, so it's what I'm saying. And I also, when I listened to, and, and we talked yesterday on the phone, I never listened to my own record, but sometimes when I listen to my own record and I did a lot, I'm saying, Oh, that's that's not really good. You know what I'm saying is, uh, it's 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 human that you yeah. that then everything is great. You know, but yeah. don't be, you know what what's really like. I, ca I call them also like when you, especially with Richard Wagner. I call them when the Wagnerians. I call them always culture talibans because Ooh. you know because they only know Wagner and this is the thing. I love Wagner don't get me wrong yeah. but there is other music around yeah. and the people they just they know everything about this opera he, he know every phrase he said and Wagner himself is a, I think he didn't take his music so seriously than the other people they take it now seriously yeah, absolutely you know and this is what I learned about cool musicians the the real successful cool guys mm. they are open I mean that's at least my experience, and uh, I mean mainly in the rock world. When when I've uh, you know when you I met you know a, 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 as you uh, a few very famous people, and actually when when most of them I they were very open. It's like amazing, easy. You know I, I was um, you know Ian Pace from Deep Purple, blah blah, yeah. and you know he was sitting on my next to me. I was driving and we we are chatting, and it's like. Yeah, I said, oh, I also have an Audi, and uh, <laughs> how did you do that? I, of course, I was curious to understand the, the chemistry in Deep Purple and how the yeah. how he gets along with Richie and all the stories, and yeah. and 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 then you know, he's so easy. He he's yeah. just anything that is good music. 
is he's in, you know, yeah. and he's does he's doing his thing, and he knows what he can do, and he actually knows what he can't do, and he's cool about it. He's cool about it, yeah. And yeah. and so, yeah, that 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 was a, a thing that um, I found pretty interesting in the people that I met. In the classical scene, I don't know. When I played with the orchestras, I had a nice <laughs> with the conductor that did the. Uh, on the live DVD that I've done with the um, Saarländische Staatsorchester, mm. Thomas Beuschel, the guy didn't know the who, you know? This was cool, <laughs> this was so cool. Yeah. Because I yeah. had to tell him, hey, I got a song by the who. And then he said, oh, what is it? And then um, he said, you know, there's that band that smashed the guitars. And he, he goes like, ooh. But he <laughs> trusted me, yeah. that, that was the good thing. Yeah. Um, Hey guys, before we go on, we have a little clip of um, um, some of your musicals. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how many you've done by now. What's well, now? Twelve. Twelve. Yeah. So and <laughs> um, so a musical is. I mean, for those who don't know what a musical is, to me, a musical is always a big production. It is like many singers, mm -hmm. and there is like um, a big story, and there is a lot involved in the musical. Oh yeah. Um, anyway, maybe we, we just um, show you the clip oh, yeah. and then uh, we talk more detail about okay, it. Okay, great. Snow White. Was wirklich geschah? Stoß zu! Das Märchen neu erzählt. Snow White Reloaded, ein neues, rockiges Musical für Jung und Alt. Yeah, musicals, that's a, a genre I'm not very familiar with, I have to be honest. I mean, I play my three-piece <laughs> rock trio, I played a few other things, but never a musical. Mm -hmm. um, so, when, you know, we go back so many years, M maybe we should start with this very early days. Oh my God, uh, that's, that's the real untold story nobody knows. Okay, t t tell what you know from your side. Well, the thing is, the, the first, um, first time I met Thomas was that I was playing jazz and I had a, had a big band gig. And uh, since I had, you know, my teacher was very into hollow bodies and Gibsons, you know, yeah. I came with a Strat like you and he said, this is no guitar. <laughs> so I had to buy a Gibson, you know. So and then I was into Gibson and, and the Gibson, they got bigger and bigger, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, from L5. I had a Les Paul. And yeah. then in the end, I had an ES-175. So yeah. I came to the big band and we had to play. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, Earth, Wind and Fire stuff and all the kind of... Like, all this single 80s note. single yeah, note stuff. Yeah. And I had my stupid ES and I said, what? I, you know, there was no chance to do it. Yeah. So I said, and I, and I came back uh, and the bass player said, you know, I know somebody, you know, he's like, he is the Strat guy. And I think he was 14 or 50. <laughs> really, it's not a joke. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is he lived in just around, the, really, three streets in, you know, in a radius of four kilometers. Yeah. So I went over there and I visited him and there was this, there it was, it was him, I think he was 14 or 15. Yeah. And he took, you know, this proud like a honey beer, you know, yeah. he, he gave me this red strat, sweatercaster. And then he showed, look, I said, look at this and I said, this is a Mesa Boogie Mark II. Two. Yes. Yeah, I was, I was so proud of that because this was my first real uh, branded gear. Because before that, I started with Aria, whatever, cheap, cheapo guitars. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they were actually not that bad, no. the, the Japanese copies. And um, I had my first homemade amps, which were total shit at that time, you know. Yeah. But um, so one day I want to go all the way and somebody I asked somebody, and what was the best? Amp? And somebody told me, yeah, the Sant uh, Santana uses Mesa Boogie, so uh, I had to get this. Must be good, yeah. So anyway, do we have the the, the picture of oh, me that's funny, yeah. from, <laughs> from the back in the days? Uh, yeah, see, this is <laughs> this is that red strat and my um, yeah. Mesa Boogie. Jugend Orchester Omasheim, for those who know That's where Omasheim so is. Funny. Yeah, well, that's just around the corner from our place where we live. Yeah. But anyhow, he gave me the Red Strat to make a long story short. And the Strat was, was really not good. It no, was, this was the shittiest <laughs> Strat Fender ever made. <laughs> and I had this piece of thing, not like this here, which is just like wonderful guitar. Yeah. It was super heavy. I think I can remember it was super heavy, heavy. like four kilos. And, and, and I hate heavy guitars, you know, I yeah. love light guitars. And it was had no sustain at all. Yeah. And it was just not a good guitar. So I, I played the gig with this. Yeah. And I looked good, you know, I was shaking around <laughs> and I didn't have to play any solo, so I, I, yeah, I, I, it, uh, but I gave it back and I said, what a fool is that who gets a guitar that so I can't yeah. get back my last ball. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, so and then after a while, you know, he, um, he came, we, 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 uh, we, we wouldn't say we were acquainted, but we weren't friends, so, but sometimes our crosses paths and he was at that time, he started to Thomas started yeah. to create the stump boxes, whatever it was. He gave me like a, a Boss OD two, you yeah. know, the crunch, the crunch yeah, yeah. that was. His thing. So he came over to my place where I lived at my parents' because because we were kids, we were teenagers. Yeah. And then they come. They, I will never forget that. And at that time, I was like, I was heavy into Jim Steinman and Meat Love and a little, little, little piano playing whatsoever, and I was composing my own songs. Yeah. And I wanted to impress Thomas because I heard he's a good guitar player. I was like, you know, that's impressive. <laughs> so I got over on the piano and I was like, little, 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 little. and he wasn't not impressed at all. He and he just said that, and that was just like, and that was incredible. I never forget that. Yeah. And he told me, you know, Frank. What you are doing with all these notes, I gonna do with one sound. <laughs> and he said that, you know, the, in German he said, yeah. but it, it, it's called the beauty of simplicity. And that was his for your first yeah, album, you my know? first album, I called it. And that I thing. thought, what a wanker, you know, <laughs> just, I just played the hell out of it. And, and I looked at my other people and they said, uh, probably he is right. And, and since that, he gave me all this, his toys. So I was yeah. like the better tester for all these toys. Mm -hmm. But since since that, you know, I'm, uh, since it, we, we were like, our paths after time just yeah, went separate, like this. Separate. You, 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 you did your career. I, of course, I got some news from the media. Okay, Frank is work. Ah. Uh, the, st uh, the studio with um, oh yeah, far studio, far, 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 far studio. Oh, that was <laughs> with, with, with the dog that was blind. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, one day you recorded yeah. there with Billy Coppin. I opened the door. Billy Coppin was, uh, you know, there. Exactly. Uh, I was there for Nazareth and other productions. Exactly. And uh, you know, all, the, the full cliche thing. You know, absolutely. I got my M's back. I, I was giving them some M's, and mm. they were full of cocaine and. 
Coke and yeah, that studio was just like a, a, a that, that was a musical that studio, and we were working over years in that musical, yeah. in that in that in that music in that in that studio. Oh. So we were crossing always. I worked in that studio. I had Chaka Khan, that Billy Kaufman, yeah. I had my own cows, and, yeah. and then I saw always Thomas with yeah. his cocaine dudes and with an Nazareth <laughs> dude, and he was just carrying his amps over. So yeah. it was like, I think this time, this time, this time, this, this will never happen again. No. The times are over. The studio times are over. Unfortunately. And, every, and everyone, and the funny thing is that, you know, it was, I think, very, it was kind of funny because I was listening at his door. Oh, how is he playing? How was he? What other? So there was a certain kind of, of good competition going on. Yeah, what is he doing? Was it? But I think that's that's totally missing today, these days. This yeah. is not happening anymore because I want to say, oh, what is he doing? Whatever. And now we're sitting next to him and I see his licks or whatever. The thing is this, I think he's one of the greatest players I know and I think worldwide. I'm not saying that because I'm sitting there, but the thing is that we don't have to look overseer. We have so many great European players, Absolutely. you know, and we don't have to think, oh, it's, oh the LA studio scene, like uh, also Alex Bayra as a rock guy or, 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 or you guys, they yeah. are just fucking world class. And I have and you know the thing is, especially when you are when you when you when you go back as me as a composer, yeah. there is no competition in me because you are actually I must say something. If I see someone who plays something I cannot do, mm. I feel inspired. Yeah, I don't I feel any you. competition. You know what? I feel uh, I feel competition when somebody is crap. Mm. Then I feel like, oh, I have to show him, please don't do that, mm. because it, it hurts me. But if, if I see something, especially when you're a composer, and, you, and I'm having many guitar players are playing now my music, mm. and they come to me and show me, and I'm so happy when they give me something, what I didn't compose, I give, right. it, it give me an impact. I say, thank you so much for yeah. the inspiration. So, and I, but this, this, I think this comes with age. And when we are at that time, especially, yeah. there, was, there was this, but everybody had that, you know? Sure. Like, what is he doing, what is he doing? But, so, but, but we have, we have a, another little a link thing you were teaching a guy um, from a band called Planet Claire oh yeah with 12 Walter. years 12 years you yeah. were the teacher at, yes. at, at age of 12 yes absolutely and Walter, yes. how old was he 11 11 ah okay cool. at 12 that we were and he came over and because the thing is what I did is and it's, and it's very funny because I had a Fostex four track Recorder, yeah. I mean, this was the latest shit, you know. So I was able in my little town to make a little studio and to play guitar and to play over it. So I and I made tapes and I gave the tapes to my when I when I had when I wasn't sitting in my class in the school and I said, listen, I'm producing records. Yeah, <laughs> it was like, a, and there was and he was so impressed about it yeah. that he said he wants to learn that what I'm doing. Like, For that, you have to learn that. <laughs> Bought a guitar just for that, I think, and he came every week, and I taught him, you yeah, know, playing See, playing guitar. You and know. this guy, mm -hmm. yeah, today is um, kind of a half of Booker Shade. Yeah, Booker Shade is one of the world's biggest techno acts from Germany. Absolutely, I yeah. saw them in Sydney, Australia. Yeah, yeah like, they're huge. Yeah, they're huge. They're huge. Um, huge. Anyway, so you know, there's always kind of thing and. I played with him when they released their album in whatever, in the 90s or whatever. Planet Claire, I yeah. know that. And I, and I was so jealous because they didn't ask me. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. And the yeah. funny thing is, you know, the, the album was full with synthesizers because they were heavily into Depeche Deep, Mode. Depeche Mode, yeah. yeah. Tears for Fears later, yeah. 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 And then we had an offer to, to, to go on tour with a band yeah. and um, we had to make it work. And then we found out it's too complicated with the synthesizer. So I thought, Walter, you play acoustic guitar and sing. Arno, you play the drums. Yeah. I do all the electronic stuff on my guitar with my effects. So this was so creative. Yeah. Um, these times were killer. Yeah. But um, from from back now, next step in in your career, when did you start? The musical thing. Well, that's a very funny thing, and, and nobody knows that because I was on tour at that time with Pete York and, and the Spencer Davis group, yeah. and, um, uh, and 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 Pete York got a, a phone call. <laughs> we were playing in Stuttgart by Klaus Doldinger, yeah. and I, I, Klaus Doldinger was, I think, he was a fan of my first record, and he said, "Listen." Uh, and there was a time the wall just came down in Berlin. I think one year, and they said, uh, "said Pete, you know what? Exactly, uh, I have an offer." You know, I have to explain Klaus Dolling as one of the biggest film composers we have here in Germany. He's Germany. wrote Das Boot, The Endless Story, and so ever. So he's, yeah. he's an icon. You das Boot. Das Boot, exactly. Yeah. And ba, 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 ba. Everybody yeah. knows that. Yeah. So, and um, 
and Pete said, yeah, you know, I'm just on tour with, with Frank and Colin Hutchinson. And so I was 25. I was, was the youngest. So, mm. and, I, and I played. Yeah. Yeah, this kind of Stevie Wonder, you know. And I, you know, I had my rhythm and blues day so far. And uh, so, and Pete was in, in Klaus Dolling, I told him, listen, you know what, Pete, I have, a, I have an offer to write a, a musical revue at the Friedrichstadt Palast Berlin. Yeah. And actually, that time, nobody knew what the Friedrichstadt Palast, and now you, everybody knows. Now it's, it's the biggest, it's biggest. Uh, is, famous, yeah. So, and uh, he said, do you know someone? Because... I, I, you know, he was so busy. He said, "Do you know someone who can do the job as an arranger or as a composer?" I said, "Petey was very sweet." Said, oh yeah, Frank is next to me. You know, he's good at arrangements. So. And so, suddenly I had Dolling on the thing. I said, "Frank, oh, I know your first record because it was in the fusion. I like your record. You know, just pick the first flight to Berlin and talk to the guys in Berlin." So I was flying over next next day to Berlin, mm -hmm. and I was sitting there on a huge table in this in this old East Theater, mm -hmm. and there was this intendant on the, like, like, like in Wall Street, was on a movie. And he, he, he said, he, I was sitting there, he said, oh, you were recommended by Klaus Doldinger, if he recommends you, you must be good. And to tell you the truth, I had no idea what I sure. did. And he was sitting, in the, in the, and that was the Wall Street thing, he said, what do you want? And I said, what? what do you, how much money? <laughs> so I was like, well, what do you mean? Well, how much money? And, and I said, um, a ridiculous number. And I thought this was the, the biggest money. And he said immediately, okay. And I go to the office again. And then later I found out it was like a, about peanuts for them, you know. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the thing what I learned. You know, the rock musicians have a hard time, which you did before you did the musical things. And the classical, there's a... There's like a society of absolutely There's you two, know, two, worlds. two worlds, two worlds, two worlds. So, so. But anyway, I mean, so you, you cross the border with the two worlds, and um, <laughs> when you talk, when you think about musicals, yeah. um, I know it's a big production, and every time I got some notice from what you're doing, mm. I found you are a maker. I mean, you know, back in the days with, with the studio, it like you recorded that album with this guy and mm -hmm. that album with that guy, mm -hmm. and you, you know, you went for it, and you had always the energy and the vision to do something and get it out and get it done. Mm. You know, some people talk about it, and you made it. Mm. And of course, I think if somebody gave you that job, just do a, a, a musical for us. You simply made it. For me, that, that's, that's a logical thing, because knowing you, what you can do, it suits your character. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Well, the thing is, that was what, how it started actually in Berlin, but I just wanted to finish the story, because what I did was, uh, I had the book I had to write was horrible, it was, it was a mess. Okay. Uh, the first musical, it was a huge flop, to tell you honestly, it was a huge, huge flop. But the newspaper, they said, you know, it's it's funny. The the, the 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 music Frank wrote has so nothing to do with music. It's so solely, it's so jazzy. And it has rock and it has this guitar in it. Yeah. And they said, give him the next job. <laughs> so everyone got fired, and I got the next job at the Friedrichstadt Palast. It's, it's a funny story. Oh, really? really, everyone got fired. Everyone. They just took me and said, okay, you want to do the next job? And then suddenly someone. The next intendant of the theater, he, he said, listen, I have to write something for kids. You want to do like Hansel and Gretel. And Hansel and Gretel was still today, if you can see it, see it on the internet, I think we sold with Hansel and Gretel, I think 300,000 uh, more, 400,000 seats. Wow. With my first person. And so they, and then they found out, oh, he can write for an orchestra because I learned that. That's a good thing. I learned yeah. that. So I can write that. And then came... Um, uh, uh, elements and this element show was still, I think it's the most successful production in the Berlin Friedrichstadt Palast with uh, 750,000 tickets. Wow. 750,000 yeah. tickets. And then came, then I come back to the Saarland and the Paradise of Pain, which was yeah. also a culture shock because what I did is actually I combined hip hop with, you know, like. <laughs> In, 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 in heavy, it was the people they were shocked in the musical scene. Sure. You know, they were really like, going. What the heck is going on? You know, and somebody, and I brought hip hop, and I brought a character from, from, from the States. He was like black, and he was Marvin, still one of my best friends. And he didn't do this ballet thing, he did 
all this MTV style it brought yeah. in the theater. So I think Paradise at that time was way ahead, ahead of the of ta time, and that's why it was so successful. I mean, still today, it's the most successful piece on the Staatstheater. It was running 60 shows, it has a TV production, and it's still theaters are playing Paradise of Pain, even though I'm, I'm just saying uh -huh. it's not my best piece, but it was from from the innovative thing you the know most innovative maybe yes mm -hmm. you know that i got uh, two weeks ago a producer asked me uh, uh why don't you do paradise of pain again you know and i was and, and i normally listen i'm uh, not listening to my own stuff so i went back and i was listening to the trick and i think this is I can't do that much better right now. You know what I'm saying? You've but this it? is no. time, what we're yeah. saying. Yeah. Some, sometimes things are successful because in the time they were made. It's the same thing what I'm just saying. Uh, to, I know I get, I, people will kill me. I know Deep Purple with Steve Morris is better than Richie Blackmore. You know what I'm saying? Because I think, you know, somebody, I kill you with that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, one, one more question about the musical world. It's yeah. like... Um, uh, um, we have to keep it short. I have a list of questions, <laughs> ah, yeah, I'll be and um, because I, I find this quite interesting, um, and try to give me just one sentence for for um, um, how long does it take to make a production of uh, for a musical from the idea to the first show to the premiere, roughly? Uh, minimum one year. Minimum one year. I'm working now on the next speech. I think everybody knows it. I'm doing Jack the Ripper, which would be a rock musical. I'm working since for Jack now since 12 months, and I still need six months. But the thing is that, um, first of all, what you need, I mean, before you get the job, you have to convince many people because musicals are very expensive. Yeah. And the idea is mainly what is the thing about? Yeah. What's the show about? You know. Yeah. For instance, when I when I wrote the Ring for for Opa Bonn, they asked me for a totally different uh, uh, topic. They asked me to do a musical about Beethoven, really. Okay. And I and I was working on the Beethoven on the on the uh, on his you know how he lived and, yeah. and I think it was totally unsexy for me. I couldn't add anything. I couldn't. I wasn't inspired because I have major admiration for, for and I couldn't, what should I do, bop, 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 and, and make it, and I said, no, I don't do that. Yeah. So it, when I had the presentation of the Beethoven, they had, they, they asked me, there was the check laying on the, on the, on the table, table. Said, yeah. they're saying, please do Beethoven für die Stadt Bonn, okay, yeah. because he was born in Bonn, and yeah, by sure. the way, he wasn't born in Austria, even though the Austrians <laughs> saying Adolf Hitler was German and Beethoven was Austrian, it's not the way it is, okay. believe me. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and when I had the presentation for Beethoven, I was presenting him, and I said, listen, And now the mayor of Bonn was sitting in the and I was saying, listen, honestly, I cannot recommend you to book me for that thing or to, to do it at all. Cool. Because I don't think it's, it, it won't be successful. Cool. And I said, and I was looking out of the window and I was seeing the Rhine, the river, and I said, but I have another idea. idea. Mm -hmm. I would like to do the uh, Ring des Nibelung because it's, it's taking place here at the Rhine. Yeah. And, the, and they look at me, is this guy... Is, What a wacko! Mad. What a macko is yeah. that? He's, he's throwing away a job, which would yeah. and I said, you know what? Give me one week, and I'm working on an expose, yeah. and I'm gonna convince you. So, and then I came up, and I t the funny thing is, I took my guitar and it <laughs> the Wagner theme, but just like 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 we notes, you know, and I do yeah. Wagner leading motives on the guitar, and they were so impressed about it because it was new for them. Yeah. And they got me the job for the Ring of Belong. It started with the guitar riff. So that's my, my next question. Who usually comes up with the stories? I mean, is, is like a, a, a theater approaching you, ask you, can you do Hansel and Gretel? Can you do blah, 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 and yeah. the topics? Or is it like you come to some a theater and say, I got a great idea, which is like, uh, whatever, uh, Ring des Nibelungen. Or well, like I said, this, what I just said was the best example. The theater sometimes coming up with an idea and yeah. a story, and suddenly it ends I, up. I twist it around and I change it. I mean, uh, uh, I have, I'm, I'm in the lucky position that I have jobs until 2024 and the next pieces which are coming out, besides Jack the Ripper, because the intendant came and said, Frank, I always want to do Jack the Ripper. Mm. And I said, Uh, let me let me get into that thing because you know killer musical killer musicals is always dangerous because <laughs> it's 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 gory you know yeah. it's bloody yeah. and uh, 
And I have this somehow since Snow White that people book me for this. Same with their mama dem lachen. He get you know where the guy the gets horrible, they, horrible they have, faces. I'm I'm the guy. I'm. They call me always. You are the Tim Burton composer. You know, what I'm saying <laughs> they always get me for the dark stuff. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, okay. Anyway, you have you you have managed to to write a couple of different styles in musicals, as, yeah. as we know or I know. Um, when you do the guitar parts, yes. um, usually you play them for a while with the production and then you have somebody subbing you. Yeah. Or, or how is this? Yeah, that was the past. And because I was young, <laughs> I needed the money. No. And, uh, <laughs> and you I always, wanted to play it. I wanted to play it because I wanted, because the thing is what I did with the guitar and the music scene, the guitar is not a very prominent uh, instrument in the musical Broadway. You always have, for instance, if you take a Hello Dolly, you Hello. This is the, you know, what you have, the guitar you don't hear, that kind yeah. of jazzy stuff. Yeah. So what I brought, you know, I started with Paradise of Pain, that suddenly you get like the, I don't know, you know, yeah, it it. riff. But before in the guitar, in the, in the musical yeah. thing, and suddenly, or you take just what you just saw with Snow White, there is this riff. <laughs> Like a, could be also Led Zeppelin riff, you know, like yeah. um, proper rock music or like not the the kind of guitar that you don't hear. The guitar is probably it's a song. It's a song, song you know. Yeah. And uh, they didn't have. And they, the the first time when I came to the theaters, oh, this guitar is loud. <laughs> you know, that was the first thing. Oh, this guitar is loud. No, it's just it's just it's there. It's right. It's right. It yeah. needs to be. Yeah, they're not used to that. So you exactly. You, you I brought in a, 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 a this, new a new color. You know, a new color to that kind of scene, which I, I like. And talking about the, the color, when you have the sounds for your production for the guitar. Yeah. Um, what are you using? What is important for you? What I mean, uh, this, that's your pedal board, right? Well, that's one of my pedal boards because this is my rock and roll board. I call it rock and roll board because uh -huh. it's it's my analog board. I think because uh, also I have to say the the, the amp one is for, for me right now one of the best analog amps out there. Uh -huh. Just period. Uh -huh. It's um, I'm also playing other stuff, but then. Like, no, I'm not playing camper and I'm not using it. This is directly <laughs> sure. I have my own philosophy for that. Yeah. But the thing is, this feels, if I'm, if I'm having a, a production which needs a, a certain kind of grid, yeah. you know, a certain kind of grid and where I, and especially where it needs clarity and we're breaking up. With breaking up, I mean like when you have a crunch sound, you have that, but you have the same volume. And cranking up uh -huh. because um, I mean music is very dynamic and this is this is great for that machine that's why I love it and I'm um, I'm a I learned to be a plexi guy I was a boogie guy too <laughs> but I learned also to be a plexi guy because if you play with orchestra and all this you need a guitar which pops out yeah. you know and uh, I need the frequency which pops out and this is this is a great app so what I'm doing always when I'm playing my productions in the studio yeah The guitar player, like for Dresden, I never played Dresden because it was an opera production. They always call me up. And mo most of the time, to tell you the truth, there are three or four guitarists because they have to change. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the show, how often is the show taking place? Well, for instance, in the Berlin Fritterstadt Palast, like, like last production, Key played 500 times. 500? <laughs> and, and therefore, it's good to have several guitar players. You have several guitar but they always play the same gear. Yeah, okay. You, you make like, you, you do like, a, like the same thing with the keyboards. They you get have a requirement, it's like, okay, you play these sounds, this is exactly. my production. Yeah. So, so you make them play the M1 as well? <laughs> in, at that time, the M1 didn't exist with ah, key, but okay. in Dresden he's playing that. And yeah. the thing is, I programmed them, I gave them my, I just make a photo and I said, this is what, what I my use. My settings, yeah. Uh, and that, I mean, for me, mandatory is also, I played on, for instance, Dresden production, I played a, I played a Les Paul again. Mm -hmm for a certain kind of sound, so then you have, to, as you know, you have to change the gain, all those things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the bass thing. But mainly what I'm saying, I'm writing into the score, the, the type of, uh, this is new for scores, for instance, that yeah. you write crunch lead. 
in the score. In the score, yes. So it is absolutely like a new way of notation. Absolutely. I mean, in the classical world, you know, doesn't exist. No, no. Yeah, but but it's. It, I think it's okay because it's like uh, this defines modern guitar tones absolutely which is important for the sound of a production yeah and uh, yeah for instance i show you an example I, i had a scene i had a song i think you just heard it from man mit dem lachen and the guitar figure is like so the guitar player Since he was a classical trained orchestra musician, he said, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know this instrument. It you know, was... <laughs> what, what is it? The synthesizer, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And I said, no, it's just a flush of You do that mm. and you learn that, you know, when you do like... First one, you, yeah. you, and you ever oh, how is he doing? They're the octaves, and the and the and you have to know when you do this harmonics, mm. what note is it? Yeah. So when I'm talking to my note editor, my score editor, I trained him. I I showed him. Listen, if I do the flageolet here, it's gonna be this sound. If I do the flageolet here, it will be sister. So yeah. how do you notate that? Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of things going on which doesn't exist. So I the the, the guitar gets in my scores as a classical instrument, and right. I think a new dimension. And so what I'm doing right now when I'm going to a production when they're having like a like an orchestra <coughs> rehearsal most of the guitar players that come to me and uh, they uh, they ask me how did you do that and then I say oh give me the guitar and I show that and said oh then and then they write like a sign how they how they would write it down to memorize it to memorize it and I learned a lot about how they how they write things down uh -huh. you know how they think and yeah and and the thing is especially now with the sounds I'm very uh, for instance for this sound I have a Uh, 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 FX clean sound, I call it FX of unclean, which is a. Tr I, I write it in the score, it has an optical tremolo. As you can. And I have a face. Sounds nice. And you write in the score faced tremolo sounds. Right. Talking about these sounds, mm. um, the, the HX effects. And this board, I mean, I mean, you are good at programming that stuff yourself. But you oh, know, yeah. you called me the other day, and I think I connected to you to another Knud. friend. Yeah, he's great, yeah. Knud, and he he built that board. Yes, well, I wanted to tell you first of all, thank you. He recommended me Knud Bausch. And he was actually here on the Academy of Tone. I don't know which number. Look it up, thirty uh, ish last year. Yeah, yeah. And and he became a guitar tech because he's he's first of all he's a great guitar player absolutely, and he's also a great classical player. He's one of the nicest guy I know. Yeah. And I went over there to his crazy garage <laughs> thing, Studio you know, and he was like, <laughs> you know, Reisen. yeah, somewhere out there you don't you know you don't want to go there you yeah. know so, suddenly, and we were like actually we were just like I I showed him you know I'm doing. I play Pat Metheny, I play this kind of stuff. And, and he, he looked at me and uh, said, okay, and uh, gave me his guitars and said, oh, this guitar is great. So we were really analyzing what can we improve, you right. know? Yeah. And he also was a fan of, of the amp one, and I came with a totally different amp. And he said, listen, you have to do this and this and this. And since I'm an endorser of a Yamaha endorser for Line 6, I said, send me one of this age. We tried the best combination, okay? Right. And the thing is, well, to make a long story short, I hate complicated stuff. So the thing is, for me, especially in a situation when I, for instance, I have a production like The Ring, I'm playing guitar and I'm conducting the same time. So I'm, I'm doing both this. Jobs. Two, three, I end up. No, you, have, you haven't seen it. It's really complicated, I tell yeah. you. That. So you're having in your mind something that, and then you need presets, you know, which are, you know, have to work where you step, yeah. step on. Yeah. So, and the thing is, when somebody is playing my music and I give him my board, he needs two three banks where he knows there is my clean my crunch my solo right, yeah. and my boost and uh, knut was like making this board so uh, uh, so, so compact and you just have to plug in one here one thing and the thing is thing is yeah you know running and and especially also with the blue box everything is set and um, th that makes it i mean it makes it reliable easy to handle and in a way um, Consistent, consistent, exactly. Yeah. And we we had we had problems with the HX, so we just we had three HX, and we were really getting into that how to make things 
easy. And uh, as you know, I wasn't a big fan of the MIDI programming with the with the with the M1 yeah. because it's, it was to me complicated. Because it's me. It's not because of it. It was me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I gave it clue and clue. Oh, it's so, so easy. So so easy. <laughs> yeah. So suddenly he became a guitar tech and he built me. A, for instance, uh, he said, you know, I love Thomas' guitar. Yeah. Okay. And he built me like a guitar which has a warmoth neck, which is great. And it's a, it's a Van Halen thingy there, and everything else is from Thomas. It's Klopman pickups and whatever. And but this is a, a vintage, vintage uh, exactly. Vintage guitar so so it's like a Frankenstein guitar, but this is one of the best tracks I have. And he, he built that guitar and. Uh, and uh, that's what we're doing. He's like a crazy guy who's always, uh, we try to do things better, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I like th these nerds like Knud. I mean, he, I mean, he's so competent and especially when it kind of comes to MIDI shit. I, you know, I'm... Yeah, he's I'm, the guy, he's, he's the guy. He's the guy, I'm, I mean, yeah. And so anyway, we have a little video. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah let's, let's, let's show that video, yeah, yeah. Uh, of Knud how he designed that board for Hello Thomas, hello Frank. Uh, I'm here to crush your video, but I'm doing this on request by Frank. He asked me to do this small clip telling something about his gear and uh, his guitar, so no time to waste. Let's start. Well, the other day, you, Thomas, asked me if I could assist Frank with his M1. And here, especially, it's integration with the Line 6 HX effects. So I wrote him, and after a few days, we met here at my place. We had a long gear talk that evening. Um, he was looking for a small pedal board he would like to tour with. Um, but not only small, but also very light, robust, and versatile all at the same time. And uh, during that talk, we found out we share the same approach, the same ideas about guitar tones. And we also do commute between the two worlds, means digital and analog. Uh, Frank and I play also fractal audio stuff as we play blue guitar stuff. We both play Santerra and all the other usual suspects. And um, uh, on that evening, I suggested Frank to switch to the Mercury edition for the more modern sounding classical channel. And uh, by the way, um, we did encounter some trouble with the HX. Yes, his HX was one of the faulty ones. Uh, but this problem had been solved before we started. And finally, I came up with this. And as you can see, uh, it's a very common combination. By that, for a good reason. I mean, uh, it's one of the best sounding analog guitar amps out there right now, uh, and a quite good effect device. So, yeah. And this is number two, by the way, because number one is Frank's board. And after finishing his board, I said to myself, I need one too. And so I did an exact copy. I mean, what to say? Uh, all the viewers know those devices, yeah. Um, talking about sound, uh, I would describe Frank's approach to sound uh, uh, similar to those processed sounds uh, late 70s, during the 80s, LA music scene, Names like Larry Carlton, Steve Lukather, Pat Metheny, and uh, yeah. But that is what he needs for his music, and it sounds fantastic. Um, we are both, well, so do I believe, uh, no Richie Blackmore or Hendrix followers. Uh, I do like Deep Purple, uh, but in my opinion, Deep Purple with Steve Morse is far better. Um, yeah, so this is uh, Frank's board, and Frank sounds awesome with this because we all know in the end it's all about his fingers. A few words about guitars. So again here, we share the same ideas. We love the Stratocaster, we like the form factor. Uh, Les Paul is somehow a, a good idea for 
uh, let's say we can make a nice coffee table out of it. Uh, so Stratocaster all the way, uh, but I removed all the vintage shit that isn't up to date anymore. I mean, who's playing 7.25 radius nowadays? Why only 21 frets? Uh, why is there still harm on single cut pickups? And if you're looking for a good tremolo, go with the GoTo 510. That is top of the notch. So Frank was very impressed by my guitars. Um, he borrowed some of them and he played, uh, I believe, the red one on his DVD. And Frank told me later, even the sound engineer was very impressed by the sound of the guitar. So Frank, you can tell the story later. So no guitars have been sold or were harmed during our meetings at all. Very important. So uh, guitars, old look, but modern features in combination with the perfect playability, of course. I mean, maybe uh, you both know the anecdote when Billy Gibbons and B.B. King met uh, during a session and they changed guitars and Billy had a strat with hands on it and B.B. Uh, gave back the guitar and said, why are you working so hard? And from that moment on, Billy played uh, eight or nine strings on the guitar. So that's it. A lot to discuss for you both. And uh, go ahead. And I'm looking forward. Yeah. Um, I mean, Knut, <laughs> what, what, what is he doing with the Les Paul a coffee table? Is, uh, he could make a good coffee table out of it. Yeah. I never heard that before. Well, uh, it took me a, a couple of years, decades actually, to love a Les Paul. Um, it, uh, I, I never had a good Les Paul in my life. In my early days, I, I had a guy that had one that was killer, but this was a, a real 59. Oh, I see. And even when I was 20, they were like 10,000 Deutschmarks, oh, wow. and which was way too much money. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, and one little comment from my side, I totally agree on the thing that we can modify the gear to make it better playable, mm. but I'm a vintage guy with a real vintage radius. Mm -hmm. You and Knut, you can go for your whatever nine and a half, and I'm going back to the compound radius. But, yes, absolutely, yes. But anyway, this it's all good. The good thing about Knut is he knows what he wants, and he knows how to get there. Absolutely. So, and um, it's a very, very competent uh, guy to talk about that. But uh, look at this. This he, he built this guitar. It's it's your thing here. This yeah. is Plug, and this is Knut. Compound radios, and it has a very. Can, can I have it for just a second? I need. To... I think it's a great guitar. If, if it. If it's a... Yeah. But all... Ah, okay. Okay. What I. The flat radius is okay for me, but yeah. it doesn't make me happy. Okay, that's, all, okay. that's fine. But okay, all good. Um, I announced another thing about cabinets. Uh, what cabinet are you using? Um, fat cap. You have the fat cap, like myself. I and think it's the best sounding uh, speaker I, I ever played, I must say that. And I uh, played many. And uh, it's, it's, I, I used, uh, had the nano cap too. Yeah, but, but of if, course it's if you need that, especially this, you know, sometimes you this Marshall Plexi thing, I think it's... Very yeah, special. sure. Me, me I'm, the, I'm a Marshall Plexi guy, uh, and the fat cap is, is like a, 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 a compact 4x12 soundish cabinet yeah. to me. And uh, yeah. So what I wanted to do in this episode today is a real unboxing oh, and... Yeah showing the audience, I mean, we have a lot of guitar nerds here, mm. um, what I thought about designing that cabinet. Oh my God, and it's, it's, it's even another layer of... Um, yeah. So, that's the first job. Then there's the, uh, my protection corners. One. <laughs> We put that stuff back later. Please remember the serial number when you get that cabinet. 
that's the one. Okay. And it comes with this protection. So we don't, you know, for me, the, the cases days are over. I mean, when, when I was younger, oh, I, had, yeah. I had the serious cases, but, you know, a case is heavier than the cabinet. Absolutely. So uh, for me, not needed. So instruction manual, <clears throat> not needed. And here we go. Um, so here is a brand new nano cap. And a few things, yeah. Not too heavy and mm -hmm. of course very compact and it's a 12 inch speaker. That's incredible, yeah. Yeah, for me the point is, let me show you what's special about this cabinet. In the last episode I, I made a comparison about nano cap, fat cap and twin cap and now I wanted to show you what is um, the specialties of this. i show you something. There is a little plate that can be removed to make it a bit more open sounding for those guys who want that. It's not me, but oh, yeah. the option is there. And this is how it goes. Okay, today I make it, I make it real quick like this. We, we have more screws in the... Are you sure? Yes, sure. Uh, okay. I have tons of spares. So this is the plate and now I can remove the plate. Wow. See, and this is, I never unbox this. This is black and it has black dampening wool. Oh. I'm proud of my manufacturers. So next thing is, let's go here. Oops, sorry. I hope. <laughs> so this is next level maybe it works yeah it works so here we get this out and you can see there's a blue guitar speaker that is actually blue Wow, <laughs> so sexy. Yeah. People. You know, I, when I designed the cabinet, I thought, you know, I'm... I'm it just has like, to be. Yeah, yeah the, the Apple guys, you know, it costs a well, dollar fifty extra. Uh, Nobody sees it, but I have it. Did you do? No way. Yeah, yeah, I went all the way. Okay. And now let me explain a little bit about the idea of this cabinet. You can see I wanted to make the smallest possible 12 inch. So there's your 12 inch mm -hmm. speaker mm -hmm. and the speaker... Um, has like the most compact uh, um, housing size yeah yeah and then there's the portation thing here that mm -hmm. gives you an extra low end low end yeah and um, that's basically it you know we can destroy it all the way let's go for it because it's fun do I see yeah Okay, this is, this is the speaker. Okay, and here comes a few little other details. The cone is extra lightweight, so it sounds good at low volume. You know, if you have a heavy cone, you have to move a lot of mass. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so... My manufacturer is weighing the cones. No way. You know, yeah. when, when you look back on the old selections for the Plexi sound, yeah. I always liked the, the ones with the Muller, Müller cones, <coughs> and they were the more lighter ones. So, yeah. And the other thing is, usually you find some glibbery stuff on the outside. Mm -hmm. It's not there yeah. because this makes it more resonant. Wow. No, wow. So no dampening, no shit. That's their own philosophy. Okay. Wow. okay. And the, the next thing is, the, the grill cloth here is made from paper. Wow. This, is, this is not plastic, this is paper based. And this is... Oh yeah, I read about it. Yeah, yeah oh. this is from the old Marshall cabinets where I stole the idea from because I always thought, what's the magic about the 60s ca Marshall cabinets? Yeah. And 
It's paper. It's paper. It's paper. Okay. Wow. And, and in the middle, I have this little um, uh, uh, wood bar that blocks the beam of the speaker. Oh yeah. So this was my little um, um, inside view of a nano cap. Mm -hmm. um, this is how we make cabinets and um, go into detail. So, but I think the paper thing is really important huh, for the sound. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, that, uh, it, I have made a, a few measurements yeah. where uh, I had like measuring microphones, and then I put in like a, a grill cloth mm -hmm. with it and without it, and you can measure the frequencies mm -hmm. versus modern plastic ones. Yeah. And the filter effect is just it takes off the harshness. Harshness, yeah. So it, it leaves the high end, the nice high end, yeah. and it it kills. This, ex yeah. this, this ugly shit. Yeah, yeah. And that's paper. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So let me see if I can move the whole thing without killing the speaker now. Do, 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 do. So, any questions about um, technical stuff like. Oh, the there are two questions, yeah. Let me see what is on here. Um, ah, Michael Friedrich. Um, Thomas, uh, was, oh, German question. I read it in German first. Was, was ist besser, die Blue Box über Gitarrenbox, wie zum Beispiel Nano Cap, oder wie in meinem Fall der Celestian Vintage rein laufen zu lassen, oder doch lieber über Studiomonitore? Danke. Okay, what's the, um, he is asking the Blue Box, which is a speaker simulator, to use it uh, with a real cabinet like that, or studio monitors. I designed it to use with mm. studio monitors. This exactly. is what we are... We're using it right now and it sounds killer. Yeah, yeah. I'll say that. Um, and using it with another speaker, a guitar speaker, would kind of do the double job. It's exactly. Like, so um, my recommendation, use it with proper studio speakers. Okay, Sven Becker. Hi, guys. A question. It looks like there is a four, four cable. cable method. Yeah. This, um, yeah, for applied M1 and line six. Ed Frank, um, did you need any equalizer compensation to overcome the sucking issues that may come with the Line 6 with the HFX? Or it's, it's, there is no tone sucking I'm, because it's a four cable method. And, and th that's why I took the Line 6 because I tried. Others. I, I, I need the real true bypass because normally I'm the guy who likes to take my cable and get straight into the amp because I think every 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 box kills something, you know, kills yeah. something. And everyone who tells me something different is, is lying. It's the direct way. It's the most puristic way. And, and that's yeah. why. Uh, and the uh, no, I don't need any compensation. The only thing what I what I'm having is when I'm having, for instance, like um, um, if I have a crunch sound. I, I like the EQ, especially when you, uh, can you see that? No, you can't see that, what's what I'm doing here now. No, no, we have a camera. Oh, we have a Overhead, camera. Yeah. As you see, this is my setup now when I'm doing my, my crunch. <laughs> this is my basic crunch sound, yeah? Now, we're doing the simple EQ, it does that, that the... It, it has more clarity, you know. Yeah. So when I have the, for instance, when I play with the band and and I think, oh, I need more clarity, and I, need, I have a, just the simple, just it's like a treble boost, you know. Okay. It gives a little yeah. look at, again. The Is this in front of the preamp? Yeah. Ah, it's it's like a pedal. It's a pedal. It's like a pedal. Okay. As you can see, the the, the boost. This is in front, yeah, and everything else. Chorus is delay, and a, a multi-delay is forged cable method. Four yeah. cable in yeah. the effects loop. Exactly. So that's always a system that um, or like you know when I'm when I'm having something for less Paul, I have also like a trouble or like a gain which will reduces the gain in front of it. See, that's called a minus boost. Where's my minus? I boost? I have a minus boost for less Pauls, for instance. Well, I have a wonderful also Maybach. 
Yeah. I'm talking about this, and this is this is just a passive volume control that just reduces the level. Exactly. Uh, so you have something like that yeah. at your. Well, I, I programmed it like you just you ah, just okay. you just mm -hmm. get the level down with it, you mm -hmm. know. And it's very the good thing is with the, with the HX, it's like you you tap on it and you see all the parameters and you see low gain, mid frequency, mid gain, right, and so, yeah. so ever. So the thing is, and when you see my sounds here, for instance, if I'm having a, my, my clean sound, it's the same, it's always the same system. You go on, a, it has a, first of all, it has an EQ, which either reduces the gain or adds some, tr some, some frequencies I know, because actually what I'm doing when I'm in the musical background, you have many things going on. And the thing is that some frequencies are, most of the time occupied by the orchestra. So right. you have to find your, your own space. Your own space for it. And that's why I always program a simple EQ. And then I just need a compressor for something. And most of the time that's it. And I have always a delay which is mainly or which is which has to be in time because that's why I have to tap it here, you know? Yeah. And that's it. I barely use choruses and, and whatsoever. Just when I'm doing some some bubbly sound, and <laughs> the bubbly sound I'm having, for instance, here when I'm when I'm doing stuff like. Well, it's the same when you go into the go into the thing. Simple EQ makes makes the sound more. Very clarity. Yeah. Play fast things like just add some some frequencies which which you need in a, in, a, in a band, you know. And sometimes I must say some sounds, even though the, some people say, oh, they don't sound so good here. I'm working with music always. I'm not interested in how a guitar sounds. If I if I like isolated. the sound, it, isolate, yeah. it's okay. But for me, and that's why I like the amp very much. It, it has to it has to work in a, in, context. in a context yeah. where you have a bass, where you have a drum set, whatsoever. whatsoever you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's I hope, hopefully that's. Uh, oh, Frank, you use Rockboard Five? I didn't know that. Do I use it? <laughs> yeah, I think. <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah, I do. Rockboard. What can you compensate the bad cap with a good EQ? Uh, that's a question I would like to answer. Okay, yeah, please. Um, uh. I I think that's. Not re I mean, it's it, it is possible to a certain extent, but if there's no substance from a cabinet, yeah. an EQ will always make it worse. You know, um, I mean, it, it, there's the word of uh, fix it in the mix, and that's the same thing like with the cabinet. If you have a great substance of a cabinet, yeah. even if it's not perfect, you can tweak it with your amp with adding more trouble. But if your cabinet sounds fizzy. Like zzz, all the time, you can reduce the highs, and it will always sound uh, <clears throat> ugly. I mean, one thing I can add is this: there is a um, most of the people they don't want to realize that, but in my opinion, the the speaker is making 40, 50 even more percent, forty or fifty percent of the sound of the amp. Absolutely. And some people say, "Oh, it's just the amp." And no, I'm, no, 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 no. And I realize that that. For me, the cabinet is like 50% of it. Yeah. And that's why I also like the, the fat cap. And I like also other, uh, don't get me wrong, but the fat cap is something... Um, Works for you in the situation. It, yeah. You plug in yeah. and it sounds warm, it has clarity, and it's never harsh. And for me, I hate harsh guitars, you know? Even though if you, if you play a Strat, and for instance, this guitar is now made by Meba, and it's a beautiful sounding guitar, and they made it really happen that the guitar doesn't sound too, you mean too straight. For instance, your guitar sounds more stratty like you know? Yeah. But I told them, listen, I need warm mids. This is where, for instance, from the sound, we are different. I have more mid, but that's okay. But the thing is, it doesn't matter what it is. If a speaker is ruining your sound and it makes it harsh, it gets on my nerves and yeah. especially you have to be you know when you play music you have to be inspired and you have to you know f f feel well with the sound you're yeah. doing and if you feel like oh something is harsh yeah. you get you get on, on the nerves yeah. you know i mean for, you know in the put the, the speaker guitar cabinet the amplifier and the electrical guitar in a context with an orchestra in in the orchestra your instrument, maybe whatever, uh, a, a, a violin or bass. It's the string, it is the wood, is the resonance room of the violin. Exactly. That is, so in the electric guitar, 
it's that thing with the amp into the thing with the wood, which is the speaker. Yeah. So that's so important. And if just because a lot of things change when you turn some knobs, you believe the amp is so important, it's half of the, the half, thing. Yeah. It's only half. And yeah. the other half is the electrical guitar, to me, consists of all these elements. Mm -hmm. And if you are not aware of it, you don't understand the instrument. Exactly, yeah. And for instance, the thing is with all these, um, um, modi how do you say modifiers, or how do you say the, the, the amps were not real? What did I say? What's the word for it? Uh, mo uh, Modelers. Modelers. And the thing is, I have, I, 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 I'm, I'm a big f fractal audio fan, for instance, yeah? Yeah. The thing is, but what I always, I always tell Knud is that it's just half of the game, you know, because I'm, I, for instance, for me, I cannot play with in ear. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm not an in ear, especially when you play guitar. Me neither. I I, I can't. I'm not happy. You know, with it. and I have to do it when I'm when I'm doing music, and I have I'm always bringing my big headphones that I have some space. But I, if I put this thing, I can't. Okay, fine. So what I'm saying, what I'm doing is when I'm seeing myself playing with 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 all this uh, um, fractal stuff or whatsoever, I always have my guitar here, and I have my great live speakers like Quested or I have Genelec, and they I have them very close to my guitar because I want to have the feeling that there is a feedback, there is a resonance. Oh, yeah. And that's was, well, that was all the kids, they do not understand that this guitar has no resonance. Yeah. You need a resonance, and especially when, when you hear here that you can sense that, that there is something coming back, and this feedback, and that gives you that, when you, for instance, do like a... Uh, <laughs> there is nothing coming back, it's like, Oh, there is no, you create sustain with distortion, but it's a different sustain when you yeah. have a feedback. Yeah. And this gives you, this is the real thing then, actually. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that's is working the tone of an electric guitar. I mean, you know, um, of course, our reality is not like Jimi Hendrix's reality where we had uh, uh, su such loud amps. But if you reduce it to nothing, then the, 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 in, isn't there, yeah, the, the, instru the instrument mm. is, is suffering. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So I, I think there is a, a, a very usable compromise in having a cabinet at a volume that works for the whole environment. I mean, mm. when I played with the orchestra, of course, I know there's a little tiny violin next to me. I, I can't go all the way like I Absolutely, do. Absolutely. Yeah. But I still have a, a, a kind of volume there to make me feel like this is not a, f a cheesy fiddle, it, this is a, it's, it's an electric guitar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's uh, Wow, somehow we are loud. What's wrong? Ah, I'm not oh. clean. There's another question. Yeah, okay. Rock guitar vibes. Have you guys any experience about using the 8 ohm? out with a 16 ohm cabinet. Yes, and that's a te technical thing. Um, for the amp one, uh, this is called the impedance mismatching. Okay, uh, what is it? Ohms is uh, impedance, and there's like eight ohm cabinets, there's 16 ohm cabinets, and some Fender amps have four ohms. Um, so if you use a higher impedance, on a lower impedance output, the amplifier will not produce 100% of the output. Mm -hmm. um, I use that a lot to tame my tube amp so I could put oh, the yeah, master yeah. a bit uh, yeah. higher, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of torture the, the tube amp, um, because I didn't have all the 100 watts for my tube amp. Yeah. And um, the, the, so I, I'm not against that. The, the only thing with the M1 I have to say is always have a higher impedance of the speaker um, than the output. Why? Because the M1 has a, a, a protection circuit, and if if the out if the impedance of the speaker is lower, like mm. four ohms, mm. the M1 would produce 250 watts, mm. and this would be dangerous for the amp. So we have. Um, the protection circuit switch it off oh, yeah. for for just a little microsecond, mm -hmm. and that is something you don't want to see happen to people that accidentally oh, use yeah. use the wrong oh, yeah, yeah. Um, thing on their Marshall cabinet. Okay, next question here: Wooden of the Angels. Okay, where can I actually go and try M1 in England? 
okay, at this uh, with COVID-19, things are difficult. Um, but in the UK, we have a distributor called JHS. They're in Garforth near Leeds, um, where they have this beautiful accent like the Beatles. It's not that far from Liverpool. Oh, really? Dresses <laughs> <And> like that. <laughs> yeah, oh, dresses oh, oh, <laughs> Rumble, bumble. And um, there are actually a bunch of music stores. That it should be on the JHS website. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, please check that. If you can't find it, send us an email or look on our website. Maybe we have UK dealers also listed. Next question, Renny R. How does the fat cap compare to, for example, a Mesa boogie caps? Ah, looking always for a good punchy and tight metal cap to support my M1 Iridium. Um, the Mesa caps are fine caps. Um, they have a slightly different philosophy. Um, um, Mesa is always a very controlled tone for me. They have heavy cabinets, they have heavy transformers in the amps, and they have a very, I would almost say stiff, controlled feel to my, to, to my taste, which might make you happy, guys, with, with, um, mm. if you play metal. My personal taste is, I want a cabinet that is kind of a little spongy, bouncy, working with the amp, like, and that's, my philosophy. I would recommend um, the twin cap um, because the twin cap is first a 2x12 cabinet that handles all this low truck 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 tightness. That's the one that you can try out from Blue Guitar. And the Mesa cabinets, um, I, oh fuck, I, I, I forgot about the, the 2x12. They sound very good too. They have a, a, a slightly harder attack. Hmm. It's a matter of tasting. I'm, I'm saying the, what I'm saying here is Mesa cabinets are pretty good for metal. Um, it's not my personal taste, but um, in our product range, check out the twin cap at Mesa. Yeah, so. Next question, Mr. Blue Pedal question. Okay, um, are buffered pedals always a good idea when you want to stack two or three overdrives? Do you recommend pedals with switchable buffered output? Do you know some pedals? Okay, that's, I don't know if you know that thing. So pedals have either true bypass, mm -hmm. um, where input and output is just connected with a wire yeah. and no electronics in, inside or they have an electronic bypass input to output with like a transistor or IC or something. The oldest pedal that everybody knows is that famous Tube Screamer. Uh, here we go. Come on here. So the Tube Screamer here, <laughs> you know, this is not a mechanical switch. This is an electronic switch oh, really? from a Japanese oscillator, you know, first floor, second floor. You're joking. Yeah, I saw that switch in Japan. And uh, if you look at our switches, you see the inspiration. Oh my God, look at that. <laughs> you know, oh. So I, I kind of took the Ivanis and made it. An, oh, look at you. Uh, yeah. And um, the thing is, this thing has a buffer built in. Hmm. And to be honest, I kind of like that. Yeah. The, the, the point is, if you stack one, two, three of these pedals in line, you have a buffer and another buffer and another buffer That's and a buffer. And saying. this is what you're saying, huh, then it's getting funky. So my ideal concept is having just one buffer and all the rest not buffered. That's my, in theory, ideal combination of many pedals. Mm. Um, that's the answer. I think, um, yeah, here we go for, for, for those details. Um, if, so we got, we got a few minutes left. <laughs> Should we play another song? I think we play probably our last song because I can smell the neighbors. <laughs> oh, this approaching, <laughs> you know. Um, um, 
let me see if I would be ready. Uh, yeah, just. Uh, it again and here we go one
yeah, I think, um, yeah, what a nice version of Because We Ended As Lovers. Um, a special song to you, you told me. Yes, the thing is that, you know, when I told you in the beginning of the story, when we were in New York, I went to Tower Records, and um, after I was, you know, digging in into this rock opera thing as an alibi, you know, yeah, to yeah, do yeah. this opera, I saw, you know, they still had tapes. And the good thing is that at that time, the Sony Walkman came out, so I was ah, yeah. into tapes. So and I got this tape on the on the on Tower Records from the Secret Police Man concert, and it was actually Amnesty International concert. Uh, 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 I think it was found by, by by Sting, and it was with uh, Eric Clapton, and he played Father Up the Road. But there was also Jeff Beck, Beck was with the first this song, time, and he played uh, Cosby and as lovers. And I was so like when he started with this like. <laughs> fingers and so on. Yeah. I was so touched. I was saying, what, what is that? And then I got wired and all the, into the Jeff Beck stuff. But yeah. um, And I know he's a big influence to you. But Absolutely. Actually, Jeff Beck was for me like the guy who, who, who said, okay, I, I need one of this guitar, even though I didn't, I couldn't play. Mm -hmm. But that's sometimes, you know. And, you know, Thomas went all the way with Jeff Beck and then I got more <laughs> into the Pat Metheny stuff. So I had a, a different direction. But that's, that's the way it is. Yeah. But actually, it's it's it, there is just that that's why I just picked the song today. It yeah. was for me like a initial thing to pick up the guitar uh, because of banding and this sound was like was just very special, special. It was so special. And maybe. actually, this is the only song that I ever covered on one of my CDs. I know I, all the rest is my own compositions, but this is the only ever cover because I mean it's it was actually composed by Stevie Wonder I know yeah I mean that, that the funny thing about Jeff Beck he's a, such a great player mm -hmm. but maybe not such a great composer uh, you know I mean when you look through all the songs that he played you see many names of keyboard players and stuff. Oh, yeah. but hey I'm, I'm a, a huge Jeff me Beck too, fan. me too but the only thing that I learned um, is Nobody can do everything at a hundred percent level, mm. and if if you are Jeff Beck and you have a thousand percent in phrasing, mm. it's okay when Stevie Wonder writes you a tune. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and by the way, do you know the story about superstitious? Mm -mm. Well, what, what what story? Tell me the story. I I, I mean, um, superstition from Stevie Wonder was also played by Jeff Beck I group. Know. Before, yeah, but but in a different key. Yes, you had to do it in E. Absolutely. Oh and God. Stevie Ray Vaughan did it in E flat, and everybody was wondering what the fuck's going on, and but, they didn't know that it. Is. Oh, this sounds slow, and nobody could sing it anymore because Stevie Wonder wrote it originally in E flat, and I played with my band in D minor just to make it make different, it easier for yeah. for the singer. It's yeah. fucking high, you know. But I I think you are the keyboard player, you know, with all the black keys on the keyboard, it makes sense to play that funky line. Yes. Because it's like a pentatonic scale, you know, all the black, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, just I don't like Mondays. You know. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a pentatonic E flat, which is only black keys. You know? Yeah, uh, it makes it easier to play, but yeah. sounds cool. So what's the story now? I didn't get the story now. That um, Beck did the song or what? No, I, no, no. Um, it's the, the cover the, the song. Yeah, it is like Jeff Beck is the killer guitar player to me, that wrote a few great songs, but look up how many songs were composed by other people. And I know people that work with Jeff Beck, like Jennifer Betton and the drummer. Um, Vinny uh, Kalayuta. Yeah, and um, I talked to some of them. Yeah. Uh, uh, Alexander, blah, what's his name? And they all work with Jeff Beck. And it's like, he's Jeff and, and, and even um, Stuart Copeland told me the story about working with Jeff Beck. He is a true artist, but he, he never plays the same thing twice. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like... I mean, this is Stuart Copeland. I mean, he's a, a wild person, but he said, you know, to, he's such a big Jeff Beck fan, and he tried to produce an album with him. And it's like Jeff Beck played it first take, fantastic. And then Stuart asked, "Man, that's brilliant. Can we do this?" No, no, it's, it's it doesn't work. He is a one take guy, and it, it's like. Can, uh, and he doesn't even remember his own stuff. Oh, that's, it is. This is that's him. Awkward. That's yeah. Right. Anyway, so what I'm saying here is we are all special creatures, musicians yeah, absolutely. Fr from, from different genres. And today, I think we had a little insight 
into the the, the world of well, musical a little, a little. We, we just we got, it's, it's a big it's much more complex than you think really it's really it's a big kind of thing but that would be another series i guess then that absolutely yeah different. There's a very last question that I will answer and then we have to quit. Oh, yeah. Nick Green, hi. Uh, just a tech question. How long should the Blue Amp take to start making sound after you turn it on? Mine takes about five to ten seconds. Is this for the tube to warm? Yes, that's the time for the tube to warm. It has that nanotube and um, its tubes are a bit slow to heat up and this mm. is what it is. And Dominic Pöli asked, do you try warehouse guitar speakers? Yes, next door I have some. I'm not going there now, <laughs> but in well, a future episode, I will show you my WGS speakers. Um, they are pretty Celestian styled speakers. That's why I like them and I picked a few models. We can go into that detail another time. For me, it's been a great, great pleasure to have Thanks Frank. Thanks for having me. Thanks. It was awesome for me to be there. After all these years. Absolutely. And um, th thanks for sharing the insights in, uh, yeah, in your world. And uh, yeah, w w whatever. Maybe w we meet again Maybe. here, somewhere else. Maybe or somewhere on this planet. Yeah. Huh. We don't live too far from each other now. No, yeah. no, no. Again. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're, you know. So, guys, um, I hope you enjoyed that, and we see you next week with I don't know what. Stay so, healthy. Well, yeah, that's, stay that's healthy. Sorry, right now, you know, and see you. Yeah. Okay. Bye Cheers. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Cheers.